Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy came home. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is for your listening pleasure, Jerry Springer. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just flew in. You did? Yeah. I, I don't know from where. Oh, from uh, Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just hey, from uh, by the way, yes. uh, and we're going to be hear from uh, James Weston a little bit later, our musical guest. And uh, he's from Nashville, Tennessee. It's a wonderful act. And looking forward to that. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about a really interesting comparison of the Russian Revolution to today's political scene in America. I'm looking forward to that as well. But I wanted Good. to mention something to you. And I don't know if you, in the, our long friendship, have you ever met my grandfather, but my grandfather was from Italy. Yes. Martino, you have to trill the R. Martino Benini. Martino Benini. From Maiano Sabina. From Maiano Sabina. Ma- Maiano Sabina. Maiano Sabina. And by the way, Jerry, in his later years, <laughs> yes. his hearing suffered. And he got a hearing aid. And he always called me Gino. And he says, uh, uh, Gino, am I a hearing and not so good anymore? And I said, well, grandfather, I saw, I called him grandfather. I said, I saw uh, kind of a wire hanging in, out, out of your ear. What is that? He yeah. said, I got it, the best hearing aid the money can you buy. You are destroying this and, joke. And I said, <laughs> I said, where'd you get it? It's, and he says, well, I went to the mall and I went in there. This is all extraneous. Got, <laughs> when you, and I got him me, me the best of hearing aid the money can buy. The salesman said, hey, no better hearing aid no, than this one. And I said to my grandfather, by the way, I like your hat. And he said, oh, I bought the hat and just the other day. Throwing other stuff. <laughs> so, so I said to Where my grandfather, uh, by the way, grandfather, and he's all, he would always make wine in his basement. And he says, I sit it down at Gino. I have a little <laughs> bit of wine with me. And he pours a couple glasses of wine. I said, grandfather, what kind of hearing aid is that? <laughs> yes. And he said, it's a, it's a four o'clock. No. It's a four o'clock. And I said, no. I said, what kind is it? No, and he see. says, oh, what are you, you got a chewing gum in or your ears? I said, it's a four o'clock. You dumb shit or something like that. Now, not, now that may yeah. have to be cut out, but he said yeah. something like that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Now, that's the you way you totally do the dis- joke. No, no it's you not. That's totally how you do the, the joke. <laughs> The j- jokes are all timing. You went on with an essay, bringing on in all this extraneous stuff. The joke it's a has setup. to be. I was setting this the guy's joke on the up. elevator. He's got a, a hearing aid. Uh-huh. Finest hearing aid money can buy. Yeah, what kind is it? Four o'clock. Boom! Just like that. And it's <laughs> just over like, like that. <laughs> Ten seconds. The joke's over. Well, because the. Kind we get no and texture. the time has to be right but together. We, get no texture. You know we don't know the guy. Going. We can't we picture the guy. We don't care that he's from Italy. <laughs> we don't even care that he's your grandfather. <laughs> hey, what are you saying about He's a lovely man. He was a lovely man, but Martin. it had nothing to do with the joke. Hey, who was that? Did you say that it was an anchor you knew of that they were all pissed off because uh, she was trilling her R's as she was doing oh, newscasts? Yeah. I think it's in either Arizona or New Mexico. Yeah, some border town. Yeah. And, and, and the people there got, you know, because they're so anti-immigrant, some of them, that they got angry that she was actually trilling the R's, yeah. you know, because that was like her background. rapid was transit or something, yeah. Yeah. Or oh, Richard. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> hey, uh, let me ask Why you Why don't you try telling a joke? Well, I, uh, hey. That was no, him no, trying. No, that was him no, trying no, to no, tell a, a joke. joke. I heard it. Yeah. I, I met your wife for the first time this week uh, <laughs> yeah. at this wedding, and I wanted to ask you something. She's a lovely lady. And I, we had a meal together. Yes. Thank you. And you paid for that. And I appreciate yeah. that. Um, what is her favorite wine, by the way? Oh I want to go to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a setup. That's for the guys in the other room. I promise <laughs> you get that in. <laughs> the line? Yeah. The joke. The line? The joke. No. Now, if so, you so, ask me that question, ask me the question. here's how the ro- <laughs> joke, joke gets ruined. You say, what's her favorite wine? I say, well, she likes well, different kinds kind of wine. Of wine. Shop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they brought out different wines kinds and of French wine. wines. And by the time you get to the, people forget what the setup line was. You go right to the, yeah. the setup, I the punchline. I there setup, is a, a structural problem with the hearing aid. I just signed a new cable. Uh, you know, the show's doing really well, so I just got to sign a new cable contract. Really? Yeah, they, next Thursday they install it. <laughs> hey, ooh. Uh. But I'm bumped. <laughs> 
Wow. Seven years ago, my wife ran off with my best friend. No kidding. Yeah, I really miss him. <laughs> that's, that's good. Oh. Yeah, that's good. I've been seeing this beautiful woman for about six weeks now. I got a telescope for my birthday. <laughs> this is ridiculous now. <laughs> those, are, those are rapid. <laughs> You're doing them rapidly. Hey, uh, yes. <laughs> Megan, she's could I ask you a question? She's laughing at my jokes. Well, no, it's yes. good. No, it's good. I'm yes. really sorry. I don't mean to be yeah. You don't mean to be laughing. My psych- not you're funny. trying not to. My psychiatrist told me I'm crazy. I said, I want a second opinion. He says, okay, you're ugly too. Oh, hey. We are now it hearing the Jerry it. Springer Show warm-up act, aren't we? This is unbelievable. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> hey, uh, Megan, can I ask you something? Oh, it's this <laughs> Say no one day. No, no, I'm gonna no, learn no, no. my lesson yeah. and no, say no, 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 no. Say yes. You. Say yes, please. Hey, Megan. Of course, yes, Megan. Gene. What would you like to know? Uh, you have used. <laughs> you've used Tinder, haven't I you? I have not. No, of course not. <gasps> What's Tinder? Nor Ashley Madison or anything like that. No, of course not. No, of course not. <laughs> no, oh wow, well, that's Ashley ridiculous. Madison, uh-huh. Everyone uses that. But no, what no, about so what's, Tinder? What's so, the Christian what's, mingle? Have you done Christian mingle? On J date. Christian mingle. No, if you. No, so, so do you not know what Tinder is? I don't. You really don't. Okay, no. so Tinder is a it's a dating dating app, and oh, I use the word right, dating very right, loosely. Right, yeah. um, so it's really true. It's supposedly like kind of like it has a reputation as a hookup site, so people just post their picture, say if they're single or married and they want to, you know, hook up. It's usually one night stand stuff. So no, I don't, no, we don't, we don't do that. No. But it's, it's funny because it's just a picture. Like you go to match, you go to eHarmony or any of those others, you have to fill out this huge, you know, evaluation. So there's not even the pretense of, gee, I'd really like to no, get to know No, nobody wants to get to know anybody. No, these are yeah. basically people like Donald Trump who cherish women. Yeah. They just <laughs> cherish women. really, really valuable. Really them. cherish yes. them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, so, no, no, I'm on match. I'm on You're on match. And, and by the way, since you have become a co host of the Jerry Springer podcast, <laughs> Tales, Tunes, and Tomfoolery. Um, what a banner day I'm, that was. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking your social life. Ha- you, you're out of crescendo. Oh, oh, I mean, it, 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 it's unstoppable. It must be unbe- It's out of control. Yeah. It's, How um, did you even find time to come here and do yeah, it tonight, knowing in- what your dating schedule yeah, is? Yeah, it's pretty intense. I got to tell yeah. you. No, yeah. no. It turns out it's not. You would yeah. one would think one would just one would automatically think. assume. Yeah. Being involved. No, in if such someone a pro- listens to this, to they this don't think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you do Match.com, at what point does it come out? Uh, by the way, I do this uh, podcast with as Jerry late Springer. as possible. Really? No, no. I <laughs> no, bet you I do, play that. I do this tell is, people. This I is do. on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm, laughs> that's awful. I bet you play that card, though. Absolutely. You say, I, I, oh yeah, but, but it's usually like you know two or three conversations into it. I'm like, oh yeah. By the way, do you listen to podcasts? Do that. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to go. There's this one I've heard of. Go to JerrySpringer.com. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> Tell me what you think about it. Happens to be me. Yeah. <laughs> Both people have listened to it. They were really excited. Yeah. Both <laughs> you, you've had two days. Two days. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> hey, by the way, seriously, it's it's actually uh, pretty cool that, well, you as a person, you you have a regular job. Mm-hmm. We call it a big girl job. Big girl job. And then you do this on the side. Mm-hmm. The, your employer knows nothing about nothing this. Nothing at all. And well, no, she no, wants to keep her job. Hold your job. <laughs> no, it's you, definitely you a, nice, a little double life there. Yeah, blend of your personality. It's <laughs> yeah, pretty neat. It's fun. I like it. Hey, Jerry, I know we talked um, over the weekend even, uh, had a conversation about uh, wouldn't it be cool if we went to Cuba <gasps> and did a podcast yep. in Cuba. Ooh, and ooh. that set me, because you know, have I'm you the guy with the business out? plan. Well, yeah, I do the business <laughs> you plan have for, the, business. Well, for the podcast. And what so, kind of business plan? <laughs> so it's go- us going got, to Cuba. This is a good one. Go. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So I got busy on that and I'm looking into how we can do it. I would love to go down there on spring air and actually sit in one of the leather seats instead of back in the luggage compartment. You are in the luggage but, compartment. Again, I know. <laughs> but um, seriously, I think it would be fantastic if we could oh, I'd love to do go that. to mm-hmm. Cuba, do a podcast. Uh, Conan O'Brien's already been there, and he's done yeah. his thing. And I've researched that and found out that he didn't really tell anybody down there. We just went and brought in a crew yeah. and did it, and nobody stopped him. Because I'd like to go in and, and have folk singers, people who are doing original music down there, do our same kind of template yeah. and do it mm-hmm. down there have some musical guests that would be and that would be have so some conversations cool. oh, be wonderful and, yeah i know we don't have a contract with cuba in terms of them getting my regular they show knew, do they know no, you? because you're not allowed to do up until this point you weren't allowed to do business there right. so no right. but 
there are people that can pick it up on various satellites and stuff because it's only 90 miles from off right. the coast of Florida. So uh, what I would want, because if they know my show, there's no way they're going to let me in Cuba. Not a chance. I, to be honest, I Googled five different ways to try to find out if whether or not you're known there. And, and I'm being no, serious not. here. Nothing said that there was any awareness of your show right. really? uh, in Cuba. So I yeah. don't know what that means because I know that there are satellites. Yeah, but I, satellite even, even in Cuba, they, they block. Well, it could be I mean, that they just don't let that happen. You're not allowed to watch American shows there. I mean, Specifically the Jerry Springer show. Hey, by the way, Conan O'Brien was not. not known. So maybe That's there's crazy. the answer. And he was network, not known. So, yeah. And if they don't know him, yeah. Yeah. then your show has more controversy than but that. But they should be happy that I destroyed Western civilization. Yeah, it helps their cause. They would like <laughs> they're, they're trying yeah. to do it too. So yeah. you're an ally of theirs. I should a be communist. a friend of theirs. Oh, yeah. Their missiles couldn't destroy America. Maybe my maybe, show. Maybe would. Jerry yeah. Springer can. Let's just send in tapes of the show. <laughs> <All right. laughs> in fact, let me just say in fairness, in fairness I, my in show with all the garbage it gets and people are so upset and all that my show has saved the american taxpayer millions of dollars how so because our show is shown throughout the world you know in, in at least in democratic societies you know in free countries it's shown throughout the world so when other countries see our show they no longer want to take us over <laughs> okay so That's we don't have to spend as much on defense we don't have to send missiles over there because they don't want to come over. Not, not you know, with that. Good Lord. Not Americans after that. are like the Springer show. Yeah. You know, so I've saved people money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Right. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. You. Thank, you Thank you for you. your service. You're right. Right. Where, where, where is my Congressional Medal of Honor? Yeah, right. that's right. It's yeah. in the mail. Oprah gets one. Yeah, well, <laughs> if Trump wins, maybe that's your best shot. Ugh. Hey, by the way. The Kennedy Awards or whatever. <laughs> Speaking of communism... Uh, you're reading a book, I know. And it's got no pictures. No pictures in the book. And the book is called... This is a big deal. Revolutionary Russia, 1891 to 1991, a history. And you were spinning a theory with me yeah. the other day yeah, about this, this connection. Serious. Talk about it. I found it to be pretty interesting. Uh, I'm reading more on Russia now, obviously, because it's in the news, and I'm trying to learn as much about Russia as I can. Because, you know, I studied it in school and just have a general interest of politics, but there's a lot specifically, I at least didn't remember, whatever. Anyway, I'm reading this book, Revolutionary Russia, 1891 to 1991. And we're now in this book in 1917 when they have the Russian Revolution, basically resulted in Russia getting out of World War I, which probably brought the end of the war much quicker because the Allied forces without Russia on its side and creating a two-front situation with Germany all of a sudden everyone was ready to stop this carnage which was going on in World War I. The most useless war in history. It was a war without purpose and 20 million people were killed. Anyway, reading on it, I just want to read one short paragraph and then relate it to what's going on here in America. The revolution of 1917 should be understood as a general crisis of authority. The Soviet was the only real political authority Yet even the Soviet had limited control over the revolution in the remote provinces. There was a rejection of the general crisis of authority that was taking place in 1917 in Russia. There was a rejection of not just the state, but all figures of authority. This is what is happening in Russia at the time. There was a rejection of the authority of judges, policemen, government officials, army, navy officers, priests, teachers, employers, fathers and husbands. There were revolutions in virtually every sphere of life. Now let's jump to America. And by the way, this is kind of what happens in every revolution that has taken place. It is basically the masses at some point, there are usually a few that are very wealthy, very powerful, the authorities, and there's a great gap between the people at the top, whether it's a king, a dictator, whatever, you have that force up there and the great masses below, middle and lower income people below. At some point, there is an abuse of that authority and the masses rise up. Be that the American Revolution against the king, be it the French Revolution, be it the Russian Revolution, and now all the revolutions that have taken place in the Middle East. It's always the same kind of thing. Now take that and jump here to America. And we are getting the same notion. It's the early stages, but look at what is happening. 
We have the abuse of authority at the top of all these institutions, the abuse of authority of the government, people being anti-government, people being anti-church, people being uh, anti-educational institutions, the anti-political, you know, anything having to do with Washington. Look what is happening now. We have the masses rising up. The game here in America right now, if we're honest, is rigged against the masses. And what I mean by that is the great masses are discouraged from participating in the democracy, from voting. Over the past 30 and 40 years, and this has all been uh, helped by the mass media, what I mean by that is in the last 30 or 40 years, if you run for political office, you take the money you can raise and you buy television commercials. Any kid born in America in the last 30 or 40 years, what that kid knows growing up about politics is everyone running for office based on the television commercials that run every 30 seconds, every minute, every commercial break, there are more commercials. Everyone running for office is either a criminal, uh, a pervert, uh, uh, corrupt, does these horrible things. There's always a grainy picture of the opponent. In other words, you don't even see commercials anymore about how good the candidate is. It's just as how bad the opponent is. And to be fair, this is done in the Republic Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. Every political commercial that regular people see that aren't necessarily political groupies living their lives and they will happen to be watching television over the last 30 or 40 years, they see that everyone running for political office, local as well as national, is a corrupt criminal or a pervert. Well, that all of a sudden builds in and then we wonder why people have such a bad view about politics and politicians. Everything they've been told is that everyone is a crook, even some of the good people that are in politics. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing that happens is that the people that are in power have tried to suppress the voting of the masses and of lower income people. And you know that goes on every election. They make it more difficult for minorities to vote. There are poor people to vote. It's harder to, they lessen the time that you can file for absentee or that you can register or that you can actually go to the polls and vote. They have police around the polls to scare you off from voting because the rumor goes out that if you go to register to vote and you have some unpaid traffic tickets, the police officers will pull you over. So some guy who's thinking, oh my God, I may have some tickets I didn't pay yet, I better not vote. In other words, they do all kinds of tricky things to suppress the vote of minorities. The reason the conservative, Republican, wealthy interests in America are anti-immigration is because if these immigrants come over, even if they come over legally, many of them, most of them, are lower income, and they're going to vote Democrat. They're going to vote more liberal. So everything built into the system suppresses or discourages middle-income people, low-income people, immigrants, new people from getting involved in the political process. Commercials, voter suppression, and the expense of campaigns, Supreme Court decisions permitting the wealthy to spend even more money for the outcome of elections. So what happens? The people that get elected to Congress, to the Senate, to the governor's uh, offices, to the uh, presidency, they tend to represent wealthier interests. And there what happens is that the laws that are passed, see now it's all legal, they pass laws to benefit people like me. They're giving me tax breaks. I mean, how stupid is that? And they give these speeches, they pass the laws that protect the interests of wealthier people, the top 1%, and they say for everyone else, we've got to tighten our belt, we've got to stop this spending, we're going to cut the budget, we're going to spend less on government programs. Well, it sounds responsible when you say we've got to tighten our belt and be more responsible with how we spend money. But don't be fooled. When you say cut government programs, you are inevitably cutting programs that benefit middle and low income people. If you are rich, you don't need government programs. When you cut a state budget, a city budget, a federal budget, you're not 
taking away the transportation of anyone who's wealthy. You're not closing the country clubs. You're not closing the private schools. You're not closing the recreation centers of wealthier people. You're not taking any, there are no cuts that take place in the life of a wealthy person, just more tax cuts, so they have even more money. We have even more money. This is what's slowly happening in our system. I'm not a crazy person saying this. It is the truth. You cut government programs, you are only cutting middle and low income people. You cut the budget, you're cutting public schools. You cut the budget, you're cutting public transportation. You cut the budget, you're, cut, you're cutting public health clinics. You're cutting social programs that help the lower income and middle income people. And that is what is happening in our system. So now you wonder why we have the largest gap in our nation's history between the top 1% and everybody else. So, we're not having a revolution here in America, yet. But look what's happening. We're getting the first signs of things being a little bit unsettling. Think about it. In the Democratic Party, Bernie Sanders, a socialist, all of a sudden has an audience. The Tea Party, anti-government, suddenly has an audience. Why does the Tea Party have an audience? Because for 30 years, you've been telling people how bad government is. So just people that, as I said, aren't political groupies, they vote against government. There's your Tea Party. Occupy Wall Street. Eh, it seemed like a little bit of a fringe thing, but that's how it starts. And they're arguing about, wait a second, what about middle America? People are getting very unhappy with what's currently going on. You have more and more shootings. You have people that are angry. Suddenly they're shooting police officers. Institutions are being challenged. Authority is going out the window. The church is being ridiculed. This is how it all starts. This is how it all starts. In the beginning, nobody pays attention to it. So let's bring this on home now. History has shown us, and it's the same throughout the world today, and it's always been the case in history. If we don't start paying attention to the inequities that exist in our system and start remedying them within the system, at some point, people aren't going to take it any longer, and we're not going to be able to be rational with them. So when I say get involved politically and from my point of view, if you want to do something about the middle and lower income people, the Democrats, they better get elected and they better start responding to this. You go another 10 years without remedying this. I mean, think about it. The powers that be, what are they against? They're trying to overturn health insurance for all people, the Obamacare. They even give it a snide name. Let's not call it, you know, the, the health act. Let's call it Obamacare, you know, so people will be against it. They're against minimum wage. Really? To let someone at least be able to get by on having a job? So they're against that. They want to cut programs. They're against everything that could help middle and low income people. If we don't remedy that, if we don't stop that movement and move it back towards let's help the majority of Americans, most American, the majority, overwhelming majority of Americans, we are going to pay for this 10 years down the road, there will be more violence, there will be more, you can't tell me what to do, I've had it. And it's not just from the left, it's not just Bernie Sanders and the socialists, it's the right wing as well, the Tea Party. And that's when you get a revolution. That's what happened in Russia, that's what happens in every country that has a revolution. It comes from both sides. It's yeah. not gonna be responsible conservatives against responsible liberals. It's gonna be the people that say, plague on both your houses, you're not solving our problem, and we'll have anarchy. That's our future if we don't do something about it now. Yeah, it's good, uh, interesting analysis. <laughs> Dr. Zhivago comes to America, be called Dr. Schneidler. The, that'll be the name of the movie. The Schmeidler was Schmeidler. my doctor. Schmeidler was your doctor. Schmeidler. Now, that, that's, uh, that, that's interesting analysis. Hey, by the way, we have with us tonight James Weston, he uh, can be heard on iTunes, and there he's on as Swansong Troubadour. 
you can also hear his music at ReverbNation.com. James, if you're good to go, appreciate hearing uh, first go. song. All right, thank you. All right. James, that is great. Where can I get a voice like that? <laughs> well, you got to get older. Yeah. No, hey, not well, older than me. <laughs> Smoke Man, a lot I... of cigarettes, baby. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, by the way, James, hey, that's fantastic. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and joined by Casey Campbell on Campbell. vocal and also on mandolin, Scott Reiser. I'm still and, on Buffalo's band. That sounded great. Hey, oh, you great. have a you have a very distinctive voice. There was a guy back in the '60s, a group called he New Christie Minstrels. Oh. Barry McGuire. Yeah. Do Do you know him by or know of his work? He's still alive. I've by heard the way. Barry McGuire's work. Yeah. 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 It's the same and he kind has of voice. A, it's a similar kind of voice. Yeah. Wonderful voice. Did he do Eve of Destruction? He did Eve of yeah. Destruction. Yeah. yeah. That's years it. ago. That's it. I've always been inspired. I mean, because I, I you know, I, I wish I could sing. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. We're doing all right. Joe yeah. Cocker. You know, yeah, Joe Cocker's yeah. another one, yeah. And, and people like that, you know. Um, yeah. Muddy Waters, even. I'm from mm -hmm. Chicago originally, so. Oh, yeah. Chess Records. James, know. are you doing uh, full time music? So I, I do some mixing. Uh, I lived out in California for about 10 years in LA, and I did some film scoring out there, is how I paid the bills. And 
Now I'm in Nashville and I'm broke. Yeah, right. Yeah. Too many great musicians. Are you doing any uh, mixing or audio work in Nashville? Absolutely. There's the Sunset Drifters album I just did. Uh, wow, we, we, it just it's endless. Every group that comes in here is just wonderful. I, I just really want to thank Casey for yeah, this. Casey's yeah. my brother from another mother. I yeah. mean, we kind of yeah. look the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we, that's we, not a compliment. We, yeah. <laughs> I know I don't like him at all. Yeah. <laughs> if anything, we we uh, we oh, we compliment Casey all the time. He's very key to what we're doing yeah. here because yeah. he's wired into guys like you and other people. I always look over at Jerry and Megan every time because often we haven't heard you guys ever right. before. And ever as you soon got as it starts, that we smile and we that. Thank here's another stuff. one, Thank you very much. a really good one. So uh, do us another song, if All you right. like. This song is uh, kind of like my old Lang Syne. I, I'm an Irish chap. And, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, just, I just like the fact that, you know, life moves on. You can't hold on to it. But, you know, it's, it's uh, the course to this is... Uh, this is not goodbye, it's just so long. This is so long, my good friend. So long, my old friends. Wish I could stay with you until the end. But I've got to go now. But I know that you'll be fine. That's a great song. James, I mentioned this to you. I also am Irish, and listening to that song made me think of my Irish grandfather, who was a union <laughs> carpenter <laughs> since I had public school. Is well, he the one with the I saw him. <laughs> Is he the one with the hearing aid? I noticed aid? he had a hearing Can aid. Can explain the joke again? My Irish grandfather. <laughs> and I said, he said, oh, no, no, please. Oh, yeah. He said the same thing my Italian grandfather <laughs> said. <laughs> with an Irish accent. Yeah, I can't do an accent. Irish accent. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh, my God. Very cool song. That Those are great. two really good songs. Very distinctive voice. Uh, yeah. We we really appreciate that you passed through here and did this with us. And want to ask you guys if you could take us out on Irene Goodnight. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, recorded live at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. Thanks to Patrick Kennedy for writing our opening song and to you for listening. Check out our website at jerryspringer.com. Well, some people love this sugar. 
some people like red wine. But me, I love my music and I sing it. Job. Oh, yeah. I think you're pretty safe. Y'all come back now.